Hello again and welcome to the Traveling Roadshow version of The Doctor in the Dugout. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Beyer, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Jonathan Kaplan, one of our newer associates at Hogue Orthopedic Institute, a foot and ankle specialist. John, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, I think that it, you talk about a topic, your expertise is in a topic that I think so fits the viewership that we have down here, which I like to call it the agony of defeat. Because foot and ankle problems just seem to be just a lot of people here golf. There's probably more rounds of golf played on the golf course down here than any of the course I can think of in Southern California. Uh, people's feet tend to hurt when they walk 18 holes or even if they ride 18 holes. Tell us a little bit about the most common things that you're seeing in your practice in terms of especially foot problems in a more senior tilted population, people in their 50s and above. Of course, so we're seeing a lot of patients with bunions and uh, activity related pain with shoe wear, particularly when they're active. Uh, I see a lot of patients who will develop Achilles tendonitis or uh, pain with activities in the Achilles tendon. And then we also see a variety of ankle sprains and other injuries when people roll their ankles or injure their ankles when they're playing sports and other activities. So to keep this um, current, let's hone in on Achilles tendon stuff a little bit. Great football player, Des Bryant, released by the Dallas Cowboys, sits around waiting to get a phone call from somebody else. Nobody calls. Finally gets a phone call from the New Orleans Saints after three or four months of inactivity. Goes up, signs with the Saints, ready to play. Second practice, last play of the practice, ruptures his Achilles tendon. Yep. How common is that in somebody who isn't really keeping in great shape and staying stretched out? And, and what does that injury mean to somebody who's doing athletic stuff? Of course. So we see Achilles tendon ruptures most commonly in people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, what we call the weekend warriors. And we think we see it because those are patients who are active on the weekends but not doing their stretching exercises. And they're basically doing enough to strain the tendon, but they're not staying active enough and healthy enough to protect it from injuring it. So I know there's a little bit of, I don't want to say controversy, but there's a little dichotomy of opinion these days about how these acute Achilles tears should be treated in active people. It used to be surgery if you want to stay active, but now there's a push to some people towards treating them by just immobilizing them in a boot, maybe with the foot down for a bunch of weeks. Tell me a little bit about what goes into the decision-making process about which way to treat an Achilles rupture. Of course, so the most important thing is identifying the correct patient. We can treat Achilles ruptures with surgery and without surgery. The key is you have to identify the patient in a timely fashion. You have to understand the risk factors for healing in each of them. And the key is with your non-operative treatment, it's not just immobilizing them, it's a very guided functional rehabilitation program. So it's how we rehab them in a very controlled fashion. So we're activating the tendon, getting it to heal, but not doing too much where it can't heal. So is the risk of re-rupture higher in the patient who's treated non-surgically? There is a slightly higher risk of re-rupture in the patient treated non-surgically. With surgery, it's usually around two or 3%. Without surgery, it's usually up to 5%. Still a pretty acceptable number and not having any of the risks of infection or skin problems that are sometimes associated with repairs, I guess that sounds pretty good. Absolutely. It's a great option for most of our patients who are weekend warriors, patients who um, maybe don't need quite as much strength as a professional athlete would. But at the professional or highly competitive level, surgery is still the way to go. Yes. And a professional athlete, highly competitive athlete, surgery is the way to go because it's going to give them the best power the best return to their previous pre-rupture level. So let's go a little bit deeper on that because it's something that's kind of always titillated me. So here's a, a professional athlete towards the, the twilight of his career, let's say, has the surgical repair. He's going to lose a little bit in terms of his vertical leap and things like that, isn't he? Yes, he is. So that's what happened to Kobe also, as a matter of fact. Absolutely. You never come back as the same player. You're not going to come back with the same explosive power, the same jump and function that you have with the Achilles. At the same time, we know that many athletes can come back to a close to previous fitness level. And so a lot of athletes can still get some time back in, their, in a few years of the rupture, but usually they're not the same player. I always like to say you can fool mother nature, but you can't fool father time. Absolutely. So now let's go to something that affects a lot more people at, at, uh, in and around us, which is bunions. I know you're doing some really groundbreaking work in terms of minimally invasive surgery to repair bunion deformities. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so it's really exciting. It's this new innovative technology that allows us to correct bunions through a series of what we call keyhole incisions, which are one to two millimeter wide incisions, maybe the size of a pea. And we can correct the bunion through these incisions and it limits the amount of swelling, it limits the amount of pain, earlier return to activity, all these things that we like to see in our post-surgical patients. So a lot of people are scared off of bunion surgery because the, the wives' tale out there, for want of a better term, is that it's very painful afterwards. They're, they're not able to bear weight normally for a long period of time. Does this somehow get us over that hump? It does. It allows them to walk immediately after surgery. Patients are walking post-operative day number one in a special shoe that we give them. Uh, their pain is substantially reduced because we're not making as large of incisions and affecting the soft tissues. And we found that they're getting back to activities quicker and back to life quicker, which is great for our patients. Are you doing people both sides bilaterally at one time or you're staging them one at a time? I'll usually stage them. Even though it's less invasive, it doesn't mean it's non-invasive. So we want them to be able to have a good foot to stand on. I, I think doing one foot actually gets them back quicker because they can rely on one foot and ease back into it as opposed to having both feet hurting at the same time. It's kind of the same rationale we use on people who are having knee replacement. I really try to talk people into only having one knee replaced at a time because yeah. I just think the rehab goes easier. Exactly. I agree 100%. We can learn from our joint replacement specialists. There's a lot of things you can learn from the joint replacement specialist, which segues us perfectly to what I want to talk about next, which is a new procedure, a relatively new procedure that's out there now called the Cartiva implant, which is for arthritis of the first MTP joint. Tell, tell our, our viewers a little bit about what that joint is and what's involved with this procedure. So what that joint is, is it's the big toe joint that I, I explained to our patients. And that joint's where we move our big toe, uh, where most of our motion is. And traditionally, when patients get advanced arthritis in that big toe joint, the only option was to fuse it. But that wasn't ideal because they'd lose motion. It'd be a longer recovery. Some of the activities that we like to do in Southern California aren't feasible with a, a, a big toe fusion. And so the Cartiva really allows us to go in and kind of clean up the joint. And we put this implant in there that acts almost like a bumper. It allows smooth gliding, allows decreased inflammation, decreased pain, and an earlier return to activity. And it has a shorter recovery. And they keep their motion of that joint. They do. They keep their motion. They may have a slight improvement of motion, but I also try to emphasize that they don't get normal motion back because this, they've already developed some stiffening, but they do keep the motion they have and they even get a little bit better. So now this is for a condition that's called hallux rigidus, yes. correct? Yes. Which is still the same joint that a bunion is involved in, but it's a different area of that joint. Let's give a little anatomy lesson to the viewers out there so they can understand the difference. Exactly. And that's a great point because a lot of patients will think that one is the other and vice versa. So a bunion is an angulation of the big toe joint. So the joint itself is normal, it has healthy cartilage, but the bones themselves become, for lack of a better word, crooked. Whereas big toe arthritis or hallux rigidus, that's where the cartilage wears out inside the joint and that they get thinning of that cartilage with, which then leads to a bony prominence which looks like a bunion or a spur on top of the toe and then they get pain due to the bone rubbing against bone. So there is a procedure that's been done before besides a fusion called a chevron osteotomy and an Aiken procedure where they kind of change the angle of the, the first toe a little bit. Kind of tell us what the indications, if any, still exist for that versus the newer Cartiva implant. So the indications for doing the chevron and Aiken is really more guided towards the bunion. If a patient has arthritis with a bunion, you can realign it with the chevron and Aiken. You can also add something called a chylectomy, which is where we shave the spur on the top of the big toe for arthritis. Whereas if someone has advanced arthritis, if the cartilage is more or less completely worn out, we know that realigning the bunion or realigning the toe is not going to alleviate all their pain. And that's where you need to do something more advanced, like the Cartiva procedure. So one thing that I know our female viewers are going to want to know, after you have these kinds of procedures, when can you go back to wearing high heels? Of course. So with the Cartiva procedure, if we're doing that alone, patients can go back to high heels usually one month or after surgery. With the bunion correction, I usually tell them it's a little bit longer because we're relying on the bone cuts to heal. So it's usually about eight weeks after surgery. So let's also attack another famous myth here. Does the shoe wear that someone uses 
influence the development of their bunions or is that programmed into them? Can people slow the progression of their bunions by more sensible choices in shoe wear? Let's, let's address that for our viewers. That's a great point, and I think that's something that we can't quite pinpoint 100%. And what I mean by that is, we know bunions are multifactorial. There's more than just other. There's more than just one cause. It's not just shoe wear. At the same time, we do know that females get it more than males, and we think that may be in part due to their shoe wear. Shoes that have a tighter toe box. So inherently, it makes sense that if someone has a bunion, if they wear a shoe that's wider, accommodates their foot, in theory, it would decrease the progression of the bunion. At the same time, there's plenty of people that get bunions who've never worn high heels in their life, and vice versa, plenty of people who've worn high heels their whole life and don't develop a bunion. So it was one of those things that we just don't know. We just don't know. We've got a minute or two left here. Let's address one other thing that I know affects a lot of people out there, and that's plantar fasciitis, the pain that comes on the bottom of the foot when they first get up in the morning or when they're doing some kind of activity. Define it for us and tell us what people should do about it. Yes, it's a very common problem that I see in my practice. What the plantar fascia is, it's a ligament that runs along the bottom of the foot, from the heel to the ball of the foot. And it can become very painful. Usually it's inflammation in that ligament on the bottom of the heel. We see it happen after an injury, after trauma. Sometimes it just starts out of the blue. And so it's inflammation in that area. The best way to treat it is stretching exercises, stretching the calf and stretching the plantar fascia. You can do a wall stretch. You can take a, a golf ball or a tennis ball and roll it along your arch. And then massaging the scar tissue or massaging along the plantar fascia to break up the scar tissue. Frozen water bottles, another one that I know a lot of people use as well to do that stretch. A great one. Well, thanks so much for being here with us today. You've really opened everybody's eyes about some of these common problems that involve foot and ankle. People can obviously find out more about you from our website at orthopedichospital.com, the Hogue Orthopedic Institute website. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day. We'll be back again soon with another topic in the world of orthopedics. You're listening to Dr. Alan Beyer. We're viewing Dr. Alan Beyer, your doctor in the dugout. Stay tuned. We'll be back soon. 